Hey guys, what's up? It's Savannah. Welcome back to my channel and welcome back to another true crime video here on my YouTube channel. So as you guys can tell by the title of today's episode, today we are talking about Carl Tanzler and I don't want to spoil anything in this episode, so I'm not really going to give you a preface as to what we are about to dive into, but all I can say is just buckle up. And with that being said, let's move on to the sponsors for today's video before we jump into the case. Okay, so our first First sponsor for today's video is Babbel. And if you have never heard of Babbel before, Babbel is the number one selling language learning app. And I don't know about you guys, but one of my goals for the new year is to learn a new language. So I was super excited when I was able to find Babbel because they have made the process so easy and fun with bite-sized lessons that I'll be able to apply in my everyday life. Personally, I chose to learn Italian because I was able to take it for a year in high school school as my freshman year language. However, once I moved, I stopped taking it and I've always wanted to learn more about it and get back into it. So that is the language that I chose in Babbel. Babbel designs their courses with practical real world conversations in mind and their 15 minute lessons make it really easy to learn on the go. With Babbel, you can choose from up to 14 different languages, including Spanish, Italian, French, and German. So if you guys want to go check out Babbel for yourself, you can do so by purchasing a three-month subscription, which will then in turn give you another three months free subscription. So basically you're six months for the price of three months. Just go to babbel.com and use the promo code killer. That is B-A-B-B-E-L.com and use the promo code killer for an extra three months free. The next sponsor I want to talk to you guys about today is Fetch. Fetch is an app that allows you to scan your receipts every single time that you go shopping. You scan your receipts, which stacks up points, which ultimately saves you money. Once you stack up enough points, you can then exchange your points for gift cards in Fetch's reward section. Fetch is an app that is easy to use. It's easy to sign up. It is easy to scan receipts and it is easy to save. I cannot stress enough how simple Fetch has made this process. You scan your receipts and the process takes seconds and you also don't have to worry about where your receipt is coming from. You can earn these points from anywhere. You can earn them from grocery stores, from Amazon, they can be e-receipts and you can even use Fetch for your takeout and delivery orders and even when you dine in or use delivery apps as well. This one really is a no-brainer and the process here is so simple so if you guys want to try out Fetch today you can click the link in the description and use the code killer to get 4,000 points when you scan your first receipt. Again, just download the app now and use the code killer to get 4,000 points when you scan your first receipt. This is a limited time offer for my viewers and one that you will not want to miss. So go make sure you hit the link in the description box to start saving today. Now I want to move on to our next sponsor, which is Solid Gold. So I don't know if you guys knew this, but did you know that up to 80% of the immune system is influenced by the gut? or that supporting the immune system through a proper diet and digestive health helps enable pets to fight against environmental allergies. Solid Gold is passionate about gut health because a healthy digestive system positively impacts the immune system and the overall wellness of pets. Solid Gold was actually the first American holistic pet food company that was founded in 1974 by a woman named Sissy McGill. Sissy was an absolute trailblazer who disrupted a male-dominated industry and created a natural pet food before it was cool. Solid Gold's nutritional platform is inspired by their belief that high-quality food is the best way to impact our pet's mind, body, and spirit. For over 45 years, Solid Gold has revolutionized the holistic pet food category, and they have a recipe for every dog and cat's dietary needs. I know my pets absolutely love Solid Gold. I have three dogs. I have two Goldens and a Labradoodle, and I have been feeding them Solid Gold for quite some time now, and they absolutely love it. So if you guys want to try out Solid Gold for yourself and for your own pets, right now to save 30% off select Solid Gold products, you can just go to Solid goldpet.com slash killer. Again, that is solidgoldpet.com slash killer to save 30% on select solid gold products. Again, that is just solidgoldpet.com slash killer.
Now, the last sponsor we have today is actually a podcast that I want to talk to you guys about. Wondery's Generation Y podcast that is hosted by friends named Justin and Aaron. Justin and Aaron have used their podcast to explore hundreds of unsolved mysteries and conspiracy theories. They've explored cases such as the Golden State Killer, as well as the unsolved murder of Lisa Ravel. In Missouri in the year 1994, Lisa Ravel, who is a mother of two and an elementary elementary school teacher was actually found shot dead in her home. Her husband, George, who was a banker and the mayor of the town at the time, was actually convicted and charged for her murder. However, he was acquitted two years later. And Lisa's murder left a lot of people wondering, was George responsible and just got off scotch-free? Or was he actually innocent? And if he was innocent, who was responsible for Lisa's murder? I think you guys are going to absolutely love this podcast. You guys love listening to Unsolved Mysteries and Unsolved cases. I see it here in the comments all the time. So I definitely think that you guys should go check out this podcast and subscribe. Go listen to the Lisa Ravel episode and let me know what you think. You can listen to the Generation Y podcast from Wondery on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and you can also listen to it ad-free on the Wondery app. Carl Tanzler was born on February 8th, 1877 in Dresden, Germany. Now, when it comes to Carl's personal life and his upbringing, there really isn't a lot of information out there. What we do know is that Carl had a sister and growing up, he was incredibly smart. He was a very smart guy and he attended a medical university. In 1921, Carl ended up meeting a woman named Doris Schaefer, who he ended up marrying and together the two of them had two daughters, one named Aisha and one named Clarista. So then in 1926, Carl and his family ended up moving to the United States. More specifically, they moved to Florida. And once they arrived in Florida, they ended up settling into a town called Zephyr Hills, Florida. However, just about a year later, Carl actually decided to abandon his family and move to Key West, Florida, on his own. And when he did this, he ended up starting a job as a radiologist at the U.S. Marine Hospital in Key West, Florida. It was said that he was born as George Carl Tanzler, and that was also the name that was on his marriage certificate. And then on his U.S. citizenship papers, he was listed as Carl Tanzler von Kossel. And then on his death certificate, he was listed as just Carl Tanzler. So over the course of his life, he did go by many different variations of the same name. Now, before we move on to Carl's personality, I do want to talk a little bit about a dream that Carl had. Carl said that he had this dream while he was living in Germany as a child. And according to him in this dream, a relative of his who had already passed away had visited him in his dream and told Carl about who who the love of his life was going to be. According to Carl, he said that his relative told him that Carl's love of his life was going to be an exotic woman with very dark hair. That was really the brief overview of the description of the love of Carl's life. And ever since Carl had that dream as a child, he always held on to that. He always held on to that dream and what his relatives had told him about who he was going to end up with. So just remember that and keep that in mind as we continue. Now let's talk about Carl's personality because Carl was known to be a little bit of a strange character. He was a little bit of an oddball and people described him as just being a little bit off. Along with that, Carl was described as being very arrogant and egotistical, and people also said he was very opinionated. For example, while Carl was working at the Marine Hospital, he was working in the tuberculosis unit. And if you are unfamiliar, tuberculosis at the time was extremely deadly. People were dying of it left and right, and no one knew at the time what the cure for it was. Absolutely no one knew. The doctors couldn't figure it out. However, Carl was convinced that he had the cure for tuberculosis. He knew what the cure was. However, he would never back up his claims with any fact or any evidence that would ever prove that he knew 
anything at all about tuberculosis or finding a cure. So he was really just arrogant about his ideas without really having any valuable information and evidence to back them up. So now we fast forward to April 22nd, 1930. Carl is still working at the tuberculosis unit in the hospital. And on this particular day is when he meets a woman who changes everything for him. On this day at the Marine Hospital, Carl met a 21-year-old woman named Maria Elena Milagro, also known as Helen, which is what we are going to be referring to her as today. Now, Helen was a Cuban-American woman who was brought to the hospital by her mother because Helen also had tuberculosis. Now, when it came to Helen's appearance, she was absolutely stunning. As you can tell, she had dark hair, she had incredible features. She was just beautiful. Now, Helen was born to her father, who was a cigar maker named Francisco, and her mother, Aurora. Helen also had two sisters named Nana and Celia, and Nana also suffered from tuberculosis. Now, when Helen was admitted to the hospital, she was actually legally married. She did have a husband. However, her husband ended up leaving her. His name was Lewis, and while Lewis and Helen were married, Helen actually had a miscarriage, and after the miscarriage, Lewis left her, and that is when she got tuberculosis, but he was just basically out of the picture, but they were legally married still. Now, during her time at the hospital, Carl, who was 55 years old at this time, so mind you, you have a 55-year-old and a 21-year-old, Carl and Helen formed a pretty nice friendship once they first met each other. And at first, you could chalk this up to being bedside manner. However, this soon took a very quick turn for Carl. Carl started treating Helen very differently than just the average patient. He started buying gifts for her like clothes and jewelry, and he eventually ended up professing his love to her. And according to the people who knew Helen, the main reaction from her was she was just putting up with this. This was her doctor. He worked at the hospital. She didn't really want to deal with the repercussions of rejecting him, so she put up with it, but the feelings weren't reciprocated. So what started out as just an innocent friendship soon became just pure obsession for Carl, and his obsession with Helen actually caused him to break hospital protocols. He would create treatments for Helen on his own in his own home, and then bring them to Helen for her to take. He would also steal hospital equipment and bring it to Helen's home because after a while, Helen's condition was so bad that she just went home. She didn't want to stay in the hospital, so she ended up going back to her family's house once the doctors knew that there really wasn't anything that they could do for her. So they essentially were sending her home to die. However, Carl did not like this whatsoever. He wasn't going to stand for it, so he started stealing hospital equipment and bringing it to Helen's home for her to use. However, regardless of the extremes that he went to and the extreme measures that he took, it still was not enough. And on October 25th, 1931, Helen ended up passing away in her family's home in Key West, Florida. However, even though Helen had passed away, Carl was not done with Helen whatsoever. He still wanted to be a part of her afterlife process. He had asked Helen's family if he himself could pay for Helen's funeral, which Helen's family agreed to. They allowed that, so Carl paid for the funeral. But this is where things got a little weird. So Carl pays for the funeral. However, when it came to the burial of Helen, Helen's family was just planning to have buried in the cemetery. However, Carl did not want Helen to be buried underground. He didn't want her to be buried underground because he said that he didn't want Helen's body to succumb to the natural weather conditions as well as the natural decomposition process. He didn't 
want to risk water getting inside of Helen's coffin. He didn't want Helen's coffin to be filled with dirt. He didn't want any of that. So he actually asked Helen's family if he himself could build Helen a mausoleum. Now, if you are unfamiliar with what a mausoleum is, it basically is an above ground coffin. If you had ever been to a cemetery, you might have seen one. They sometimes look like small houses and they hold the coffin inside of it and it's above ground. That's basically the whole point of it. So when Carl approached Helen's family with this proposition, they again took him up on his offer. So Carl ended up building Helen this entire mausoleum that was put in the Key West Cemetery and Carl visited her mausoleum almost every single day night. And this wasn't like Carl was just simply going and visiting her mausoleum every single night to pay his respects. Carl, actually unknowing to Helen's family, was the only person who had the key to Helen's mausoleum. And again, Helen's family did not know this at the time. So Carl would actually open up the mausoleum and sit inside of it with Helen's body. And again, he would do this almost every single night. And every night that he went there, he would also bring formaldehyde in order to help preserve Helen's body and slow down the decomposition process. Now this went on for two years. Yes, two years. This wasn't just, you know, a week or two weeks of Carl doing this. He did this for two years. Two years of visiting Helen's grave almost every single night. Two years of bringing the formaldehyde to help preserve her body. And after the two years is when Carl said that Helen started talking to him. This is when Carl said that he started hearing Helen. And Helen was asking Carl, according to Carl, Helen was asking him to remove her from her coffin and to take her out of the mausoleum. And Carl said that once Helen asked him to do this, once she was talking to him, he knew that this is what he had to do. So in order to prepare to remove Helen from her coffin, Carl actually ended up building an entire laboratory. He built this laboratory. That way he would have somewhere to bring Helen's body back to once he removed her from her coffin. So on one night in April 1933, Carl went to Helen's mausoleum and removed her from her coffin. He actually ended up putting her into a toy wagon and started rolling her out of the cemetery. Now again, it's important to reiterate that while Carl had tried to preserve Helen's body, this was still a body that had been dead for two years. So you could imagine the condition it was in when Carl removed it. And Carl went to extreme measures to make sure after he removed Helen from her coffin that her body would stay the way that it was before. Carl had actually attached Helen's bones together with piano wire, and he gave her glass eyes in order to try and replicate her own. Now, because most of her skin was already decomposed, Carl actually replaced her skin with silk that was soaked in glass to kind of give this paper mache effect. And because her hair had already fallen out, Carl actually took took a wig that belonged to his mother and glued it on to Helen's head. He also went as far as stuffing Helen's chest with rags in order to have it keep its original shape so it wouldn't sink in. It would look as if her body was still the same. And Carl also dressed Helen in the clothes that she was wearing when she passed away. Now, where he got access to these clothes and how he was able to get his hands on them, I have no idea. However, he did dress Helen in the clothes that she was wearing the day that she passed away. And to mask the smell of Helen's decomposing body, Carl would spray insane amounts of perfume onto Helen to try and mask the smell. However, even with the perfume smell, it did not cover the scent of the decomposing body at all. If anything, it just masked it and it was now the scent of perfume plus the decomposing body smell. Now, once Carl had fixed up Helen's body to the best of his abilities to try and preserve it even longer, he actually took Helen's body back 
home with him. And Helen's body lived with Carl every day after that. It would sleep in Carl's bed with him. He treated Helen's body no differently than he would treat Helen if she was still alive. And to answer the question, if you are at all curious, yes, Carl would also have sex with Helen's body. Now, this next part that I'm going to tell you, you are actually going to think I'm making this up at this point because this does not even sound real. However, Carl had actually mapped out a plan to launch Helen's body into space. Let me repeat that. Carl wanted to launch Helen's body into space because he thought that launching her into space would almost be like a resurrection ritual and she would be launched into space and she would come back to life. He actually went as far as trying to create a launch pad in order to launch Helen into space. Now, you might be thinking that this might have gone on for a couple days, maybe a couple weeks, maybe a couple months, but this actually went on for seven days years. Carl kept Helen's body for seven years. And in 1940, so again, at this point, Carl had had Helen's body for seven years. Helen's sister had actually heard a rumor that Carl had Helen's remains. Now, I'm not sure how this rumor got started. Clearly, it was not a rumor. However, when I read this, I questioned how the hell something like this would have gotten out, who Carl was telling, and if he did tell anyone, why the heck didn't that person say something? My question just is, how was this enough of a rumor to end up getting back to Helen's sister, if that makes sense? However, when Helen's sister heard about this, she decided to take matters into her own hands, and she ended up going to Carl's house herself to see if she could find anything. And when she got to Carl's house, she looked into the window, and that is when she saw Carl dancing with her sister Helen's body. Again, she was still dressed in the clothes that she was wearing the night that she had passed away. And I would just like you to imagine that feeling. Imagine looking into a window and seeing this man dancing with your sister's body who has been dead at this point for about nine years. Carl had kept Helen's body for seven years. However, Helen had been dead for nine years at this point. So you can just imagine what Helen's sister was feeling when she saw this. Obviously, her sister contacted the authorities right away, and when they arrived to Carl's house, they arrested him. A psychiatric evaluation was conducted on Carl, and the results of that evaluation were that Carl was sane. He was sane so he could sit trial. Carl was charged with maliciously destroying a grave and removing a body without authorization. However, because the statute of limitations had already expired at this point, the charges were dropped and Carl was completely free. Carl was released and no punishment was given to him for what he did to Helen at all. And as if that was not frustrating enough, Helen's body, after it was discovered with Carl, was not given a proper burial. Her body was actually put on display at the Dean Lopez funeral home where over 6,800 people came to see her body because as you can imagine, when this story broke, it was a media frenzy. And when Helen's body was put on display, a lot of people wanted to see it because they had heard about this story and could not believe it. So they ended up going and visiting her body and it was completely put on display for the public. Eventually, though, Helen's body was returned back to the Key West Cemetery where she was originally buried in the mausoleum. However, now she is there at an unmarked gravesite in a secret location at the cemetery. That way, no one is able to try and tamper with her body again. Now, you may be sitting here thinking that this is one of the most bizarre cases you've ever heard. You cannot believe that Carl was not charged for something like this. However, there are, surprisingly, a lot of people that would disagree with you on this because there are a lot of people out there who truthfully believe that what Carl did was romantic. There are many people out there that actually sympathize 
with Carl by saying that what he did was an act of love, it was a loving gesture. And I would just like to clarify, not that this would make this any better, but this was not Helen's husband. That was This was not a boyfriend of hers. This was a man who was her doctor, who according to everyone that knew Helen said that she was just putting up with Carl for the sake of it. She didn't want to have to deal with it. She was just kind of going along with it. For all accounts, this was a stranger who took her body and kept it for seven years. I'm sorry, but I don't see the romance in that. I don't. So because Carl was never charged with anything, in 1944, he moved to Pasco County, Florida, where he did not move in with his first wife, Doris. However, they did remain in close range. They weren't far apart. Their houses were not far apart from each other. And it was actually said that Doris was very supportive of Carl once he moved back to Pasco County. It was said that she was extremely supportive of him, which I am not sure how nor why. And Carl ended up receiving his U.S. citizenship in 1950 in Tampa, Florida. Now, throughout the remainder of Carl's life, Carl was still under the impression that Helen was the love of his life, and he actually went to the extent of creating a death mask for Helen, which if you are unfamiliar, a death mask is essentially, from my understanding, and feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, a death mask is basically a mask where you replicate someone's face who has already passed away. So Carl created a mask that looked very, very similar to what Helen looked like and what Helen's face looked like. And Carl actually attached this mask to a life-sized effigy of Helen. And if you have never heard of what an effigy is, an effigy is a life-sized sculpture or replica of a specific person. So he created a life-sized sculpture of Helen and kept it in his house. Carl lived with this sculpture until he died on July 3rd, 1953, and his body was discovered on the floor of his home three weeks after his death. And that, you guys, is the case of Carl Tanzler. It is absolutely insane. I have never heard anything like it, and the fact that Carl was never charged with anything because of the statute of limitations is mind-blowing to me considering the fact he kept Helen's body for seven years, the extremes that he went to, basically treating it as if Helen was still alive, sleeping with the body every night, dancing with the body. It's one of those things that you hear in horror movies. This is one of those cases where once you're at the end of it, you think, this is something I see in a movie. And this is something that doesn't seem real. However, this did happen and i am so interested to hear what you guys have to say about it 